So I hope everybody had something nice to eat because now we're gonna start uh, a lot of interesting talks and I want everybody ready for that. So uh, now I want to invite to the stage uh, Sergi. He's a very good friend of mine. And he is gonna be talking about watchtowers, but not like I'm going to be explaining you how they work and so on. No, no, no. He has something, I think, quite more interesting prepared. So, Sergey, welcome. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, guys, let's first check that this works. Um, because, you know, these things, okay, yeah, it looks like it works. Right, so uh, for those of you who doesn't know me, I'm Sergey Delgado. Uh, I've, been told, I've been working uh, on a company called Talaya Labs for around two years now. Uh, that's a Square uh, grantee company, so mainly Square is like um, uh, sponsoring my, my work. Uh, I go by Sergi on Twitter, like um, GitHub and so on, like on the internet uh, by itself. And today I wanted to talk about watch hours, but in a slightly different uh, fashion that I've been uh, doing for, for the last two to three years. So as I was saying, I have had uh, multiple watch hours presentations uh, starting in the Lightning Conference in 2019 uh, from a more uh, conceptual uh, point of view to uh, advancing Bitcoin in 2020. Uh, then during the pandemic, uh, I was part of the um, Fullmos uh, <laughs> podcast, uh, also about that. And most recently in adopting Bitcoin. And I think I've been talking about this like for long enough. Like I've explained everything that I wanted to explain about how it works. Uh, I've tried to like make my point about like why it should be used, uh, why it's important, and like how it goes. But I feel like sometimes there are some uh, questions that get uh, unanswered. Uh, so I thought, why not we like turn this talk around and instead of like me telling you what I think is important about watch hours and why they matter, why don't you ask the questions that you want to know and then uh, I answer them so you know like I can fill uh, whatever gaps are there. So with that thing in mind, I actually posted a uh, tweet like two days ago when I was supposed to have already handed my presentation like 10 days uh, uh, before that. So I'm so sorry about that. Um, asking you guys like, what do you think is important? What do you want to know? What do you, what you don't know? Like, just let me know. So the talk is going to be about me answering the questions that people ask me on Twitter. Uh, I hope I have enough time to like also answer the ones that you may uh, also have. Uh, I, I think we, we may have time for that. If not, just please uh, catch me uh, offline and I'm always happy for like to uh, have a conversation about this and see like if there's any synergy tools, whatever you're uh, building and so on. So first question, uh, basics first, right? So like I got a question about uh, the basic for noobs, like people think, uh, I mean, people need education. I uh, completely agree that education should uh, always be the priority in this community. Um, so even though I've talked about this a lot, I'm just gonna like use a little bit of time to explain uh, how lining works in like two minutes and how watch hour works, what's, what's the main idea behind it. Uh, so we can like kickstart with that. So first, most of you may already know this, uh, it's not gonna be new, but just for the ones of you that may not. Um, that's how a lining uh, channel life cycle works. So it starts by a funding transaction. Uh, this can be um, done by two parties, but normally it's done by one. Um, so normally one party, Alice, like uh, deposits some funds in a multi-sig uh, contract. This is normally embedded in a pay to uh, witness a script hash, which is not like super important, but just like uh, so we can check it out. Um, and from that point on, we get one UTXO, which is shared between like Alice and Bob. And that's the one we use to uh, commit to all the states in the channel. So like from that point, once uh, that funding transaction is confirmed, we start like uh, exchanging transactions between uh, one and the other. And those are the payments that uh, flow in the Lightning Network uh, through that channel. Those are called commitment transactions and they are all, uh, do we have it? Yeah, uh, they are, oh, it's not working. Well, whatever. Um, those, all those commi commitment, oh, okay. Uh, it doesn't matter. All those commitment transactions are double spending transactions uh, among themselves. So the thing with that is from the point of view of the owners of the channel, only the, la the later state of that commitment transaction is valid. So only the, la the later commitment transaction. But from the point of view of anyone else in the network, any of those transactions may be valid. 
right? So like if any of those transactions hits uh, the mempool, maybe include in a block, and that's gonna be uh, how the channel is gonna be closed. Uh, the normal uh, cycle of, of this would be like at some point we would decide to close this, uh, this channel and we will build a transaction that doesn't have any of the logs that uh, the Lightning Network transactions have, right? So like we actually don't remove those logs, we build a transaction without those, those logs because those transactions are actually not stored uh, in our nodes. We only have uh, the signatures that we need and the information that we need in order to build uh, those transactions. And if, that's, uh, if everything is agreed uh, upon, then we can close that uh, channel uh, sending the corresponding amount to Alice and the corresponding amount to Bob with the closing transaction. All right, but it can also happen that uh, one of the parties uh, decides to cheat and use uh, an old communion transaction to close the channel. If that happens, that's called a channel breach and what the other side of the channel is supposed to be doing is creating a penalty transaction claiming all the funds of the channel uh, for themselves, right? In this case, uh, Alice would be the cheater if Bob realizes about this, it can create a penalty transaction spending all the funds uh, of the Alice Bob contract to Bob, right? That's what normally happens, and that's what happens if there are two nodes which are constantly looking at the channel state. But it can also happen that one of, the, of these nodes is not online, and that's why uh, watch hours are important. If you're not always online, then your counterparty may try to cheat, and you have to try to avoid that. So in order to fix that, there are watch hours and the interaction uh, of uh, uh, the user side and the clients, uh, sorry, the client side and the um, server side of, of the watch hours is following. We have the user side, which is uh, the node, and the node has uh, some commitment transactions and some penalty transactions as we have seen. For every single new payment that uh, it's uh, performing this channel, the user is gonna pick uh, the commitment transaction ID, a part of it, and it's gonna use this as a locator or a hint just as, as an identifier for the watch hour to look at something. And uh, it's gonna take the whole commitment transaction uh, ID, it's gonna hash that and use that as a secret key in a, um, a symmetric encryption, sorry, encryption scheme to uh, encrypt the penalty transaction and send that encrypted blob uh, to the watch hour. So the watch hour receives a locator and an encrypted blob, right? That's 16 bytes of data plus whatever uh, size the, the encrypted block has that depends on the size of the transaction. And that is sent to the tower. From the tower side, what we're gonna do is uh, for every single transaction ID in every single block that we process, we're gonna compute the locator in the same way that the user uh, computed it. That's the uh, 16 most uh, significant bytes of the transaction ID. And if we get a hit, so if, we, if one of the locators that we compute matches with one of the ones that we receive from the user, that means that there's been a breach. If that happens, we will compute the, the secret key in the same way that the user uh, computed it, and then we will be able to decrypt the encrypted blob, uh, get the, the penalty transaction, and we can use that uh, to penalize uh, the, the cheater, right? So that's in seven minutes, six maybe, uh, how watch hours work and how the Lightning Network works. Next question, infrastructure. All right, infrastructure is always needed. So uh, we have Luis here asking uh, for more free public alternatives like uh, BTCLN, uh, for people who have uh, uh, one node with little, little resources. And I uh, completely feel you. So that's why uh, I, we have like this, it's not a partnership, but we've been like talking with uh, the guys at Voltage. We recently released uh, version 1.1 of uh, the IO Satoshi in Rust with the core lining uh, client. And uh, we got in touch with Voltage, as I was saying, to offer this uh, altruistically in their servers so you can like hook your uh, core lining node using the client to their watch hour. So like you can run your, your own, but if you want to like try it out uh, at some point in the near future, this is, we are just like uh, we're still testing this in, in this version. Uh, you will be able to like use that altruistically, and then if eventually you want to run your own for like your friends or like for to make a profit out of it, you will be able to do it. When I can tell, as I was saying, we are still uh, testing this out with version 1.1, but it should be with version 1.2, who is about to release. It's not released because I'm here. Uh, if I were at home, it should have been released already. Uh, for how long is this gonna uh, be, be offered? I cannot tell, I mean, as I was saying, uh, the whole purpose of this is realizing about like how much information we are gonna be needing to, to, to store, if it's like viable to like running altruistically or not, like what's the business model behind it, and so on and so forth. And maybe others uh, may follow altruistically or non-altruistically, that's uh, the whole point of this. <sighs> oh, uh, that's my favorite question. So we get the re recurring one. Uh, there's Swiss routing asking when watch hours will be cross compatible between LND and C lining. Uh, I'm not uh, 
like trying to like beef or like point pinpoint uh, like finger uh, finger point here or whatever. But I really feel this question. I've been trying for interoperability in watch hours since 2019. Uh, the main issue that we have right now, so I can talk about the IOP Satoshi, that's uh, the tower that you can use these days in C-Lining. It's not a C-Lining specific tower, it's just we have a, a plugin for C-Lining. Uh, the idea behind the IOP Satoshi is for it to be a watch hour that you can use with any uh, node implementation. The problem is that in order to be able to use it, you need uh, your node to feed you the information you, you require, right? Penalty transaction information and commitment transaction information. The problem with LND these days is that they have a closed API for that. So you can use the LND watch hour with, the, with LND, but you cannot access that information without LND. So I haven't seen like any willingness of changing this up to this day. Like I had like many conversations. I sent like many emails, like this haven't, hasn't changed. I have to say recently, like two weeks ago, uh, I had some informal conversations with people from Lightning Labs. They are revisiting the um, watch hour uh, code base. Um, I cannot uh, talk uh, for them. Like, I don't know if they're gonna like um, make this different or not, but I think there's still like some hope that this may end up happening. Uh, believe me, I'm the first uh, one interested in this. I want watch hours to be usable for any kind of uh, node. So like, if it happens, it happens. I'm just hoping for it. Um, next question. We have Kali here who asked about size. So uh, what kind of inform information is being sent to the watch hour? How often, uh, how often do you need to sync it? What's the uh, data traffic, this space uh, usage, and so on and so forth. Uh, so thank you, Kali, for being here and asking such an amazing question. You made me run the numbers uh, because I was not completely sure about this. Um, so about the numbers, with respect to uh, um, how often, I mean, we can like uh, default to the, the, fir the first uh, question and answer, that's uh, how often you, you get that information. With respect to the data, so every payment requires two channel updates, right? You, you get one, the, the first channel update for adding an HCLC to a transaction, and then you get another channel update to uh, finalize that HCLC, right? To, so like to move it to whatever side of the channel you have to move it and make it uh, a final. So every single time you make a payment, there's, there are two updates, right? That means that you have to send an appointment that like encrypted blob plus locator to the tower twice per payment, okay? Uh, and there are also like some uh, overhead uh, in terms of registration to the tower, not to the town. That's my uh, fault. The numbers are as follows. We have uh, in terms of per user, so there's a registration between the user and the tower as you saw in yesterday's uh, workshop if you were there. Uh, and the information we're storing from the user is mainly the user ID, the available slots, uh, so the available slots for appointments that the user has if they have paid for the subscription. If not, that's for free, but we need to like keep track of that in case they are paying for it. Um, when the subscription starts and when it ends. That's 45 bytes. Uh, it's, it's mainly like the compressed uh, public key, which is the, uh, the user ID plus some U32s. Uh, in memory, we are actually storing the same information, and I realized that may not be needed running the numbers the other day because the subscription sort is not used uh, in, in memory. So uh, right now it's 45. I may make able, be able to like uh, get it down to 41. Um, so I may when I come back home. Um, in terms of appointments, which is actually where uh, most of the data comes from, uh, we have to distinguish these uh, between uh, two different states. We have the non-trigger appointments and the trigger appointments. So non-trigger is all the information that the uh, user is sending to the tower, but there's been no breach. If there's been a breach, then something gets triggered and you end up storing more information because you decrypt that and you also uh, end up like storing the commitment transaction and so on. So if it's non-trigger, which is like most of the times, you get an UIUD to identify the uh, transaction, the locator, the encrypted blob, the self delay, I'm not gonna get into that uh, now, but like the uh, user signature and the star plot. That's give or take uh, 356 bytes if we assume that the, the commitment transaction is around like 250-ish bytes. If it's triggered, we also store the, dis uh, the dispute transaction, so the, the penalty transaction, so sorry, no, we store the dispute transaction in case we need to like rebroadcast that for any reason. Imagine that there's a reorg and we lost uh, that information. We may try to like push that back. Uh, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, we will do our best. So in case it's triggered, we will store like around 620 20 bytes. In memory, uh, if you remember from yesterday's talk, there are three main actors in, in the tower. There's a gatekeeper taking care of the user there's a watcher taking care of watching for breaches, and there's the responder taking care of 
uh, the justice transaction or the penalty transaction getting confirmed um, in, uh, with enough confirmation. So in terms of the user, what we are storing in memory is not much, around 20 bytes. We have the watcher, that's where most of the information is, is stored, and that's around 114, that accounts for UID, locator, and user ID. And also we have a map of locators and user IDs, mainly because we are looking for locators in the blockchain, but we are uh, identifying our, our things internally with UIDs. That's mainly so like the user cannot um, screw with us, sending us uh, some like replicated data and so on and so forth. Um, and then in the responder, in case an appointment is triggered, uh, that would mean that all the information regarding that locator would be uh, completely wiped from, from the watcher. Uh, then we will be storing like the penalty transaction ID, the uh, user ID, the status, and also another map, right? So it's like 114, 130 bytes, depending on what state uh, the deployment is in. So in total, uh, for a non-triggered appointment, uh, for non-triggered appointment, sorry, of the same user, uh, we will be storing around 356 bytes in, in disk and around 134 in memory. And have in mind that you have that twice per payment. Right, so the deep ones. Yes, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Let's, let's. No, no, not really. You send the information to the watch tower and then you can like continue doing payments. Exactly, you, you, you send it as long as uh, they, uh, the watch tower replies that it has it, you don't have to do anything else. Uh, I mean, all this triggering and, and all, all that stuff normally doesn't happen. It only happens if there's a breach. So like the watch tower keeps like storing information over and over and over again, and then if there's a breach, like asynchronously, it will like decrypt that and like uh, make you well, close it, cl um, send that penalty transaction to your closed channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean it's it's blocked in C lining. It's blocking from the receiver side. So like you send this information and you wait to the watch tower to respond. Mainly because like if you want to make sure that that has been uh, backed up, you shouldn't like proceed until that happens. Um, it shouldn't take too long, or, or because like if, if it does, uh, then your channel may be blocked during that time, right? It, it, it normally doesn't. All right, so I have three minutes, so maybe it's enough time to the deep one. So Brian asked this amazing question. Um, let me let me try to like go over all on like all all on my take because like I don't think there's a proper answer uh, to this question, but at least I'm like super happy to discuss it. So. He asked if there's been any consideration for a uh, full light client instead of uh, like having to run. So watch hours normally run a full node uh, uh, underneath, right? They are uh, processing all the information, they are confirming all, all, all the blocks, uh, validating all the blocks and so on. And he's like, okay, maybe that's, that shouldn't be needed. You shouldn't be uh, required to like validate all these blocks. This should uh, be doable by a, a light client. Um, and also, uh, he's making a point where he says that even if a block is invalid, but you have seen a, a dispute, you should like push that transaction to the, to the network and like try to like keep pushing it because like you have seen that. So, my take, I, I don't think this is an, uh, I mean, uh, in contrast to the other ones, I don't think this is an answer, this is just my opinion. There hasn't been like much uh, effort putting into uh, light clients, at least not on our side. Uh, and this, is, this, this comes from two sides. First is like an inherited dependency from Python, uh, the Python code base, the old Python code base, uh, where we were building directly on top of Bitcoin D. Now with the Rust code base, we are building on top of LDK, which does a lot of the heavy lifti lift lifting for us. But before that, uh, we were building a stray away on top of Bitcoin D. Why? Well, Bitcoin D good, right? Like it's uh, a really robust piece of software. It does reorg man management for you. So like you cannot go, go wrong by like building directly on top of Bitcoin D. Um, by doing so, and since we need to like query information about transactions that are not part of our wallet, we need to run that with transaction index indexing enabled, right? Meaning that you cannot prune your node, you cannot like do any kind of like fancy uh, data redu reduction stuff, you have to like uh, have it all. Is this really nece necessary? Well, I do agree that like block validation is definitely not necessary. Uh, Actually, at the application layer, we don't do it. We just like check the, the uh, transaction IDs and we react uh, using that. For the Rust version, we really don't build on top of that and LDK does a lot of, of the heavy lifting, so we may be able to actually uh, do something about it, uh, mainly because like LDK also does real management for us. I'm not that sure about uh, if we can like uh, get around um, the querying of information that is not part of our wallet. I mean, we do that mainly because we need to 
make sure uh, that uh, things get confirmed. So you have to like stop the, the tower for whatever reason, whenever you start it again, then you have to make sure how many confirmations every single thing you are uh, watching have, because that's not gonna be like the same, well, it may not be the same many confirmations it had when you were running, right? So like you have to keep up. And in order to keep up, you need to like check all, all, all that information. Um, not an expert on like on light clients, like there may be a way of uh, going around that using also light clients, so I, I, I should uh, check it out. I don't know where I stand on the uh, pushing penalty for uh, stale blocks and invalid blocks, mainly because it complicates the state machine of the watch hour a lot. So like what we do is mainly we uh, send the penalty transaction, if there's a reorg, uh, but the commitment transaction uh, doesn't get out, then we publish the penalty transaction again. But if there's a reorg, and the commitment transaction get, gets out, uh, at some point, I mean, we may try to like send it back, but if we cannot send the commitment transaction back, then we assume that that information is not penalized anymore, and we send the uh, data back to the watcher. So it's like, we don't forget it, but it's like, okay, if this gets triggered at some other point in the future, we may react again, but we are not gonna like be pushing and pushing and pushing until it gets in. So that's just like how we design it. There may be other ways of doing so. In any case, I'm more than uh, happy to like discuss this and like see if there's any way of like uh, making uh, this lighter. Even though you may have ha you may have to like store all of information, but um, if we can like take some of that out, it may be nice. So I think I'm like one minute out of time. But if there are any more questions, I'm well. Maybe I'm happy to answer them. Maybe I'm not. I don't know. Time for one now. Open arms. When, when a client uh, connects you to the um, watchtower, mm -hmm. does it sync all its previous states? No. Uh, right. No. It doesn't, and it's mainly because normally you don't have that information. So, like, you may need to, like, pull all this chat tree and, like, get, like, every single, like, previous state and, like, do it. I, I mean, it doesn't in the core lining client, mainly because, like, there's no way of doing it uh, as of right now, at least. Like, if, there, if they implement, like, a way of going over all that and getting all the information, we may enable that and do all the dumps. Uh, because mainly, if you don't have like every single uh, state backed up, it's kind of like the same as not having any. Uh, mainly because uh, an attacker can use any of those that you don't have backed up to uh, screw the tower. So what's the case when the connection drops between the client and the watchtower? If the connection drops, the client has, uh, I mean, stores that locally and retries to send that to the watchtower until it becomes available. So like if uh, you, so if you're like registered with the tower, but there's a, a connection br uh, break, the client will like store all the all that information locally and like try to like send that back to the watchtower uh, like every now and then. I mean, at some point it will uh, like stop, but you can like manually retry to send that, all, all that information. So like you will like back, back all that up f from like the cl uh, the watchtower client, not from uh, C lining, mainly because like they don't store all that information because they don't need to. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. seen it being a problem with LND that these, uh, when the multiple watchtowers were connected and uh, the client was building up all this log with the dropped connections, yeah. then you know it, it at some point it got very memory intensive, like you know taking out gigabytes. Um, yeah, in our case we don't store that in memory though. Like we store the, uh, I need to check that out, but I'm I'm pretty sure we don't store. I'm I'm sure that we don't store like the encrypted blocks on memory. If it fails, we store the identifiers and we drop. No, I'm sure we drop all that information in the database and then. We try to like connect to the to the tower. If it succeeds, then we pull on the information from the database and, and we send it out. That's that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. Okay, so we're out of time no uh, as normal uh, here. Thank you, Sergey, for Thanks. this talk. Woo! <laughs> now I want to welcome Martin. Uh, yeah, he's coming.